Hello everyone, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. I am James W. Gesso, your host here, and I am going to share with you my experience and my results in getting my THC genetics tested. For my 34th birthday, my partner bought me this THC genetics test, which is from Lobo Genetics. More about them in a minute. Um, and I thought it would be exciting to share my experience and my results with you. Um, my first encounter with how genetic variations influence the metabolism of cannabis, cannab cannabinoids, such as THC, uh, came from an interview I did with David Krantz, episode 111, about cannabis neutrogenomics, which... Nutrigenomics is the study by which our specific genetic variations influence how we metabolize and interact with various nutrients, and cannabis nutrigenomics essentially being the same thing specific to cannabis. But since that original idea, I actually ended up getting in contact with this company, Lobo Genetics, uh, sorry, yes, Lo pardon me, Lobo Genetics, and getting uh, an interview organized with one of the members of their team, Samantha Gordashko, to not only present you my results, but to break them down step by step. So that's what's coming up in a minute. Um, I'm going to be interviewing Samantha Gordashko, and she's going to go through what my THC genetics tests uh, results were insofar as how I metabolize THC in general, as well as how my metabolism of THC impacts my risk factors for either acute or chronic mental health risks, as well as how my metabolism of THC um, influences my working memory and thus general motivation. So... Those are the things we're going to talk about in this uh, interview that's coming up in a minute. We're also going to talk about a couple other things, one of which is why these variants and what other variants are possibly influencing uh, cannabis metabolism and why they focus on some variants and not others, as well as an important discussion about privacy and data, um, because your genetic data is important data and you probably want to have a sense of <laughs> essentially what this company is doing with it. Before we do, let me give you a sense of what this test looks like. Okay, so this this is the test. I, I shot a previous video, which you're seeing on the screen here, um, that opened up all the different things inside of it. And essentially, I swabbed the inside of my cheek with three different swabs, put them in a return envelope that was included in the package, and sent them to the company. And then I got my results online, which are available through the platform at Lobo Genetics. And within my results, there's a breakdown of not only my results, but basically all the data they have around that specific genetic variation and how it influences uh, the metabolism of THC. I was pretty happy with how these, uh, how this test unfolded, as well as even the price and how my relationship or my interaction, excuse me, with Lobo unfolded. So Lobo has also agreed to offer you, the listeners and the participants on YouTube, um, of Adventures Through the Mind, a discount code. So if you use the promo code Jesso, it's my last name, J-E-S-S-O, over at lobogene.com, you will be able to get a 30% discount off uh, getting a THC or a CBD genetics test. Uh, I'll talk more about that at the end, but suffice to say, that's the preamble. Um, and now we're going to jump into an interview with Samantha Gordashko to talk about the results of my THC genetics test. Samantha Gordashko, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Thanks for taking the time uh, to jump on this call to talk about my THC genetics results. Thanks for having me. Uh, so you are uh, an employee of Lobo, and we're going to go through my results together, and you're going to give me a sense of what it is that I what it is that I'm actually learning from this genetic uh, test results. You got it. Yeah. Um, are you able to pull up your report on your end? I am. Yeah, I've got it going here. Awesome. Um, so I've logged in and I'm under the, uh, I'm currently looking at the metabolism uh, page, but I can go to the summary. The metabolism page is great. We can start there. Great. Let's do it. So your result came back as a normal metabolizer, which is no surprise because 80% of the population is a normal metabolizer. 
Um, but what that actually means is your body produces enzymes, um, which help to bind to THC, which allow it to be removed from the body efficiently. And so your enzymes are the right shape to be drawn to THC optimally and then allow it to be processed as inactive at a normal rate. So for some people, um, who are slow or very slow metabolizers, their enzymes are a slightly different shape. And so it doesn't do that process as quickly. So that can be problematic if you're consuming an edible, for example, because it means that when that edible comes into your system, a lot more of it is going to filter through your body and you're going to be high for two to three times as long as mm. somebody like you or I who might be a normal metabolizer. Um, so they did a study um, where they gave a hundred people or so a 15 milligram oral capsule of THC and they tested their blood every hour and they were looking for how much THC is in the system. And then of course, how much of the inactive THC is in the system. But when we consume cannabis orally and that enzyme binds to THC, it also creates a super active metabolite. And that metabolite is actually the one that makes an edible feel different than when we smoke cannabis. So that so so that is 11 hydroxy THC. Is that right? You got it. Yeah. Yep. So that's the one. And so um, for people who are slower, very slow metabolizers, they have more of the superactive metabolite in their system, and it lasts for a lot longer. So you or I as a normal metabolizer, it might take us 12 to 24 hours to reduce the amount of THC in our system by half. Slow metabolizers, it can be 72 hours. So days. So, so wait, wait, let me let me get this let me get this straight. So then, if, if I were a slow metabolizer, um, which I'm I'm looking at. I'm looking at here that the my genotype is the CYP2C911, and if I were a CYP2C933, um, I'd be a very slow metabolizer to the point where uh, I actually produce more 11-HOTHC because it's taking so long for the THC to be processed that it's like hanging out in my liver longer. Is that is that a correct? Yeah. It's it's like uh, the enzyme will bind to the THC, and it's just not quite the right shape. So it's not quite the right shape to be filtered. So they call it first pass metabolism. So let's say you had 100 parts of THC go in your system and your enzyme binds to like 50 of them. Um, that shape, if you're a slow metabolizer, doesn't go through first pass metabolism. It doesn't go directly from the liver to the kidneys and leave our body, which means more of it is now floating around in the system. And because this enzyme is such a shape, it doesn't clear the body as fast. So it takes a lot longer for the body to go, okay, we've done our work. It's time to calm down, get to the kidneys, get the heck out of here. So it just takes a lot longer for that process to happen. Hmm. So it's not, it's not necessarily producing more of this, uh, of this metabolite. It just hangs out in the bloodstream longer. So it has more time to bind and rebind with the endocannabinoid receptors. Yeah. So basically the kidney is looking for the perfect shape to go, this is no good. I'm going to get rid of it. And normal metabolizers, that happens to quite a bit. So out of those hundred parts, let's say that it immediately gets rid of 60 mm -hmm. uh, of that and then lets the rest of it go. And that process, this first pass metabolism sometimes can explain why two normal metabolizers may have a completely different experience when they eat the same amount of THC in an edible. Mm -hmm. Because even though you have the same metabolism rate, there could be things going on in your kidneys that allow more of the THC to work through the system at the, at the same time. So there's also that issue with the edibles that can make it a little bit more more challenging to guarantee you're going to have the same experience as somebody else. Hmm. Yeah. So that's interesting. I, I'm seeing on your site. We won't talk about it here, but you also, um, you know, on Lobo, you also break down how many people percentage wise have what gene variations according to what ethnicity, and then specifically outline this this metabolism process that you were talking about. Yep. And how it differs in different modes of consumption, um, yep. and even how how different metabolism uh, or genetic variants will influence, you know, like how long it'll take for drug testing to not, you know, not detect the THCs in your system. Um, yep. But let's let's leave that aside because I want to I want to get into the sort of the the second of the three sort of categories that your company tests for, um, leveraging this. Um, this edible dose response thing yeah. because um between my partner and i it's sort of a thing where she can eat like 20 milligrams and be cruising and i eat like five or six and any more than that and i need someone to hold my hand um yeah. so my assumption was that i you know 
I must be, you know, like one of those people who just have like a stronger dose response or something. And maybe she has a lower dose response. I don't know. Um, because it certainly isn't familiarity. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with putting cannabis in my body at this point in time uh, in my life. But uh, one thing that became really interesting when I got my results back was some of the results that came up around my mental health, which might um, explain why it is that I, you know, have like a lower dose threshold for my comfort level. So let's go into my mental health uh, results and explain to me uh, what we see there. Sure. So we're looking at a gene called AKT1, and AKT1 is a gene that makes a protein in the brain, and that protein is involved with the way that dopamine is cleared from cells. So your variation of this gene is actually the most common. 50% of the population have it, and we call it intermediate risk. Mm -hmm. And what that means is your when you consume THC, it causes a cascade of dopamine to flood to the front of the brain, and that's what makes us feel high. Um, but for certain people, most people actually, um, this protein takes a bit longer to help clear the dopamine away from those cells. Or it allows too much of the dopamine to be sucked into the cell at one time, and that's actually the memory gene that we test. So these two things kind of come work in hand in hand. And so at the intermediate risk level, it means that for someone compared to somebody who's a lower risk, um, your your brain will have more dopamine in those cells at one time. And having too much dopamine in the cell at one time can make you prone to feeling anxious or paranoid or um, have any of the other adverse effects. And so that's why it's more short term for your genome type. Whereas um, the high risk category of mental health, these are people who are more prone to also long-term risks. So most cans of cannabis you buy legally will have the disclaimer on there that cannabis can cause or lead to schizophrenia and very serious mental health issues. And that's based on studies of people who have these mental health issues. They look at their history of cannabis use, and what they're finding is if you have this genotype, and you were a cannabis user at some point in your past, you're very likely to be diagnosed with a serious mental illness. Hmm. Doesn't mean it's going to happen for sure. If you also had a family history, that would be another indicator that you should be more aware of this. Um, but for most people like you, it's a short-term risk thing. So I might feel anxious or paranoid. My heart rate might start going crazy. I might think things that I wouldn't normally think. And that's what we're talking about in mental health. And so we're looking at what does that gene look like? What does that protein look like? And then how well are you clearing do clearing the dopamine from those cells? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the connection there with the edibles was being like, oh, maybe I'm just more prone to being overwhelmed and, and she isn't. So she hasn't gotten her uh, her test done. So we, we were not able to compare our results. Um, but it was something that I found pretty interesting. It also kind of tracks back to some questions that have been sort of floating around about drug-induced psychosis and what does or does not lead towards it. And, and from my research, and, and it seems like this, what you're saying here about the genetic variants and the, the, the nutrigenomics around cannabis is that as much as lifestyle and usage and all these other things are significant factors, the most significant factor is a genetic predisposition towards developing psychosis. So do you happen to know if this particular gene is that gene that seems to be associated with increased risk of psychosis in general, or is this in particular to THC? It's in particular to the way that it clears dopamine. Okay. So other, other psychedelics um, like psilocybin, for example, causes a huge flood of dopamine to the, to the front of the brain as well. So it's also a very dopamine heavy experience. And so if you have a genetic predisposition that affects the way that your mind clears dopamine, that's going to happen anytime it's released. It's going to happen when you're happy, when you're stressed, all of those sorts of things. All right, just cutting in here on a quick fact check on Samantha's comment there about psilocybin increasing dopamine in the brain. Not exactly true. Kind of True, sort of, but not exactly. According to some research uh, in a paper called Effect of Psilocin on Extracellular Dopamine and Serotonin Levels in the Mesoaccumbens and Mesocortical Pathways in Awake Rats, they do find that there is an increase in extracellular dopamine inside of the nucleus accumbens, but not in other places, and it's even decreased in other places. So fact-checked on Samantha there, um, not entirely accurate, but not exclusively inaccurate. Anyway, so that's the fact check. Now back to this conversation with Samantha. 
let's see now is it possible for of the of the other variants um that like you have a lower chance of of being overwhelmed in one way or another i mean with my having the intermediate risk does that mean that i'm more likely to have short-term responses but not long-term responses and if i have i mean uh consequences for psychosis um but if I have like an increased risk, does that mean an increased risk of long-term psychosis, but not short-term or like, how does, how does that all sort of play? So we looked at a couple of different studies, um, looking at mental health, their genetics and cannabis use. Um, these studies are flawed. So I'll be the first one to say it. It's the best body of science that exists, but they, for the most part, they're, they're pulling from groups of people who have already been hospitalized for mental illness, and then they're cross-referencing those people with their genetic uh, variations and then looking at their cannabis use. So mm -hmm. you can already start to think about from a science perspective how problematic that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is where this, this link between psychosis and schizophrenia is coming from, is that there's very clear studies with these groups of people that that happened. And so we did pull from those studies and that's where we're getting this increased risk for long-term with the particular version. Um, the other interesting study that we pulled from was a few hundred participants who had no history of mental illness. And the researchers, I believe they're in the UK, they actually went into these people's houses, had them consume their own cannabis by smoking, and then had them um, complete a survey about their feelings and they checked their biometrics and all of this sort of stuff. They took a, a, a piece of their cannabis to the lab and they tested it. And what they found was, the, the only variation that was a predetermining factor of whether this person was going to have a short-term adverse effect like ang anxiety or an increased heart rate or um, even paranoia was their genome type. Mm -hmm. And so what they found was the people in your category and in the high-risk category are more likely to have short-term adverse effects than people who are in the low-risk category. And so if you think about it, okay, I'm going to smoke a joint. It's going to cause, the THC is going to come to my brain. It's going to cause a flood of dopamine to come to the prefrontal cortex. And then my body has to have these proteins that are going to clear it away from the cell so that I can be normal again. Um, if, if your brain is doing that at a very rapid rate or a very slow rate, you're going to have a different experience. And so that's where the variation comes in is like, how well is your brain clearing dopamine? Hmm. Okay, cool. Um, now, moving on to the third uh the third variant that you test for um which also has to do with dopamine clearing which is yeah. how uh thc use affects the memory yeah so we're looking at a gene called comt and comt is actually the most heavily researched gene that exists and so now that one thing that our company does which is really great is we tell you exactly what gene we're testing and what variation you have mm -hmm. so COMT with this big body of research behind it, you can go, I'm COMT version, and I know that you're like me, MET MET. Mm -hmm. And MET MET is the most rare version of that gene. So cool. we have cool. we have MET MET, we have MET VAL, and we have VAL VAL. So you're actually low, lower risk for impaired memory when you use THC um, because your COMT protein is such that it's not sucking as much dopamine into the cell at one time. Um, and it hangs out there for, for a good rate. Um, interestingly enough about your genome type, you're genetically happier than people who do not share your genome type. Oh, well, today would not be evidence of that, but, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> I'm just it's kidding. I'm in a great mood today. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like dopamine is in your brain when you're happy and then it hangs out there for a long time. It doesn't clear away as fast. Um, and so COMT, they also, we put it in your report, some fun things like, are you a worrier? Are you a warrior? And, and, and COMT has been related to introversion or extroversion and different things about your personality because dopamine is also released when we're stressed and how well you clear that from your brain affects how you respond. So in terms of cannabis, we've smoked the joint, it causes this flood of dopamine to the brain. And so we have one gene, the mental health gene, which is like, how fast is it clearing? And then we have the COMT gene, which is how much of it is being sucked up into the cell at one time. Hmm. And so if you have a lot of dopamine in your cells and they're hanging out there for a really long time, you can imagine how that would impact your prefrontal cortex. And memory is a big part of that. So is your reaction time. And so that's why they say you should not be operating a car or heavy machinery or doing complicated tasks 
when you consume cannabis. Um, and so the, the testing that we looked at, there's a few. Interesting one is that they took a bunch of people, they had them in a room individually, and they gave them THC through smoke. And they had them do a bunch of cognitive tests. So they had to do memory recall, matching, um, they had to do word finds, they had to do all these cognitive functioning tests, and then they cross reference them based on their genome type. And your category performed the best. Um, great, the, great. The, the, our the, category. <laughs> our category, yeah. Um, the, the middle category, the intermediate risk, performed notably worse than mm. they would have when they were sober. And the high risk category was like off the charts, terrible responses in comparison to when they were not under the influence of THC. Um, so that's a really interesting study that's used not just with, you know, COMT and kind of making a loose connection, but like a very solid study where they tested memory under the effect of THC and cross-referenced by genome type. And it was, the evidence is very clear. Hmm. Interesting. So what you're saying is that genetically I can smoke cannabis and drive. No, <laughs> not what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. Uh, okay. So. I have another question here, and, and 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 fair play, I could be asking you to step outside of your area of expertise, but what you're saying here is that you know the met met means that I am more likely to have dopamine hanging around, or I'm more likely to clear dopamine out. I, I just need that to get clarified. Yeah, it's going to hang out in your brain for longer. Okay, so then I'm wondering what about how then cannabis might and this gene factor might. Uh, be relating to my ADHD. Do you have any sense of, of that? Yep. Yep. So people with MET-MET are, COMT, are much more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Hmm. Um, it's, it's one of those things. Um, you, can, you can look it up for yourself. You can do a little Googling of COMT and ADHD, and you'll find studies that correlate this. Um, People with this genome type, and not from any particular study that I can cite, but through anecdotal evidence where they've done studies where they're compiling many different papers from many different researchers and, and their works of, of study. But what they find is people with our genome type actually usually respond better to cannabis, and it may help improve focus, and it may help to improve their cognitive functioning. So there may be people who are using um, THC or CBD even to help combat their ADHD and finding it a lot more effective than, let's say, a stimulant. Um, because with this genome type, of course, a stimulant is going to react the opposite than if you had the opposite genome type. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I, it, if really, it it calls to me this this thing that I get excited about, which is you know essentially like genome spe genome specific medicine, um, which is you know assuming that our society doesn't completely collapse as a consequence of a dysfunctional economic system that only leads towards greater destruction of our natural environment to the point of eventual extinction. I feel excited about the idea that we might end up getting genome specific medicine, which something like this met met uh, co Com T uh, variant might be, uh, you know, obviously associated with. Yeah, definitely. Um, I like. I also have ADHD, which it was funny because when I got my genome type and I looked back and I was looking at the research, I was like, oh, this makes so much sense. Also, like, I'm the kind of person who I might need to do a task and where my friends are like, oh, there's no way I could do that after consuming cannabis, and be like, really? I don't. I don't. Uh, it's fine for me. So oh, interesting. Yeah, I think maybe maybe. Maybe this calls me to be just doing more cannabis randomly throughout the day, uh, without trying to alter my without trying to alter my um, you know my my goal set for the day and just see how different things. I know that with a little bit of cannabis, I'm god damn, I'm good at doing the dishes. I just like walk right up and I'm ready to do them. It's no problem. Um, yeah. But reading, maybe not so much, uh, or writing, yep. definitely not for me. So these are the three things that you test for, these variants that are about metabolism, mental health, and memory. Um, yep. But there are other variants that you're not testing for. Why? Why are you testing for these ones and not on these other variants? Yeah. So in order to, so I mean, our company has the capability of doing a genetic test on any gene that we can put through our process. Um, but we have to look at which genes have established bodies of credible research that were done with cannabis? Mm -hmm. So these three genes have had studies that were done and are valid studies that Health Canada and the NIH in the States recognize as being valid studies that say, hey, we're going to take these participants 
we're going to give them cannabis and then we're going to cross reference their genome type and then we're going to publish the study. Mm -hmm. Um, sadly that has not happened for very many other genes. So, I mean, it's, it's coming, it's coming, but it's nice to know that it's, it's happening with some genes. Um, now this is basically why you've been invited to come on is to basically talk about, you know, like my results slash an opportunity to sort of educate people on, you know, what can be learned if we get our THC genetics tested through Lobo in particular, but generally if we get our cannabis nutrigenomics uh, assessed by somebody. Um, and part of this is that, you know, in, in a couple minutes, the, the people watching this video or listening to it, wherever they're checking it out, are going to get a chance to, you know, get a discount to you know, to go to Lobo and get their genetics tested. And one of the things that I talked about in the intro when I was filming myself doing the swabs and whatever else is something along the lines of privacy. Um, And the, I mean, some people don't give a shit about, you know, like essentially anonymized genetic information, but other people are legitimately quite concerned about what companies get access to their genetic data, which is a part of, you know, is a pretty intimate part of big data. Uh, So what is your privacy and security protocols at Lobo? So we are a privately owned company. Um, We're based in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. Our servers are Canadian and they are private, protected, encrypted, and secured. Um, we do not check your ID when you're registering your account. So if you wanted to give an alias and give them your burner email, you're <laughs> more than welcome to do that. As long as you have access to um, receive your results and log in, you can do that. And then you can, of course, request to have your data deleted from our servers and cancel your account at any time. Hmm. Um, we do not buy, sell, gift, trade, or swap information with anybody. And we cannot access your account or your results um, without your email address. So I can't just go into a database and look at the list of emails and see somebody's results. So we experienced that together. I needed the right email address so I could look it up to make sure I I had your results. And you you don't even, you're not even looking at my results page. You're looking at like the result, like the information being gathered from somewhere else in your company explicitly upon my request, which required a series of of pieces of information that otherwise you wouldn't have to access it anyways. Yeah, yeah, and I actually had to forward your email with the confirmation to our lab team who then was able on the back end just to send me an email back just saying star one, star one, CT, met, met. That's all I got. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so we're, we're, we're doing as much as we can to make sure that um, your information is safe. On our end, we're collecting it as aggregate data because we find this very, very interesting. So how many people from which demographics are being tested and what are we seeing in the results? Um, And so, you know, we know that these genetics are within these certain proportions, but we may find some interesting data. Um, And and we're we're looking at aggregate data in order to help um, strengthen the cannabis community to do more innovation and to help people find strains that might work for them based on science and debunk a lot of the myths that are happening. Um, But we are, we're only looking for these three genes. So other companies who are big name where you order a kit for $150 or something and you've got to spit into a tube that's crazy, they're pulling your full genome. They have access to the entire book of you. And what we're looking for is just these three genes. So each one of those swabs is looking for which version of that gene do you have? And your sample is actually destroyed in the process. So if we were to have a power outage in the middle of running your test, we would need you to re-swab and send us a whole new set. Hmm. Okay, cool. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, now, for the people paying attention who are watching this, I'm going to cut away and uh, I'm going to talk about my experiences with Lobo and with the genetic testing and blah, blah, blah. Um, and if they stick around, then they'll hear me ask you this next question, which is about you know what what is Lobo moving towards um, launching uh, for the benefit of the whole cannabis community. Um, so uh, hopefully people will stick around. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay. So that's it. I really hope you learned a lot here. I personally learned quite a bit, um, in general about myself. Actually, this information was pretty, 
interesting for me to contemplate insofar as my own relationship to cannabis, because of course the subjective elements are important in the sense of like my subjective relationship to the medicine or to the psychoactive molecule or to the plant. Um, but also in the sense of having this objective biological genetic data in order to make assessments about essentially the, you know, the, the, the biomolecular profile of the plant and how I can best utilize my relationship on a biological genetic level to optimize that subjective relationship. Hopefully you'll get something similar if you choose to get a THC or CBD genetics test. Um, again, you can go to lobogene.com and uh, use the promo code JESSO, J-E-S-S-O, to get 30% off a testing kit. Um, if you don't feel like you got enough information in this video about nutrigenomics in general, uh, cannabis nutrigenomics, cannabis specific uh, genetic variations and all the rest, I highly recommend you jump over and listen to my interview with David Krantz, episode 111, where we talk pretty in depth about this. Well, we talk for 90 minutes about this, about these, um, about this area of research. Um, and then of course expand it because that's the way long form podcasts go. So, Thanks for tuning in. Check out episode 111 if you want to learn more. And if you want to get your genetics tested, uh, head to lobogene.com. Use the promo code JESSO, J-E-S-S-O, to get 30% off a THC or CBD genetics test. If that's all you were here for, sweet. See you later. Peace out. Have fun. Like and subscribe. Bye. But if you want to stick around for a second, what follows from here is a conversation with Samantha about this other project Lobogene has been doing, which is Lobojane.com. Lobojane.com uh, basically being this really cool sort of search engine based in genetic information, not only about the specific genetic variables in people insofar as the metabolism of cannabinoids, but the genetic um, information of the plants themselves. So tracing strain on uh, and being able to search according to strain, as well as terpene and, Canada, and THC profiles and all the rest within all the legal products that are available in Canada, which is pretty cool. So mind you, I just explained it, but she does a much better and more in-depth job. So stick around right now. We're going to hear from Samantha about Lobojane.com. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what Lobo is developing based on this uh, aggregate genetic data that you're gathering um, and what it's offering to the cannabis community with that information. Yeah, so um, we have developed uh, an AI powered smart search function that is available on the web for Canadian cannabis users at this time, um, which allows them to shop for strains by science and if they've had their genetic test done, also then by their genetics. And so the idea is uh, I've had my genetic test done. Now, what strains do I try? Okay, mm -hmm. I know I'm I'm higher risk for memory loss, for example. What does that mean for me? Well, we have some evidence that shows, and now granted, evidence on terpenes and genetics and cannabis is really weak, but we're doing the best we can to collect information that we feel like is strong enough. And so we found that uh, there is enough evidence that suggests that pining is actually helpful in memory when mm -hmm. you're consuming THC. And so we would show you a list of products, but we would rank the ones that have pinene in them higher on your personal algorithm if you were higher risk for memory loss. Somebody like yourself who is higher risk for mental health adverse effects, you might find that your results are lower in THC and also have some CBD in them when possible because we know that CBD tends to um, negate the adverse effects of THC. So we're, we're doing that. We also have the ability now to, we've documented 90% uh, of the Canadian strains, uh, their land race strain name and their genetics, um, as well as their terpene profiles. We've gathered information from the LPs. And so if you're looking for a strain that you love, like you were at your friend's house and they had some OG Kush and you're like, I know the name OG Kush, but I can never find anything named by that when I go to the store or whatever. You can type in the words OG Kush into the search bar and it will show you the OG Kush strain or products called OG Kush near you. Hmm. And then it will give you the profile on those products. Um, you also can search for cannabis by desired effect. So 
I would like to feel uplifted or energetic or calm or I want to relax, uh, for example. Or let's say you want to do some painting or you're going to go out with some friends or you want to chill for the evening. So you can also shop by effect or, or activity, um, which is kind of cool. And then, of course, you can also just search for, hey, I heard that there's tea. What is this? And you can go to effect and you can look for tea and we'll show you the teas that are available. Oh, tea. I was like, I was still thinking about this from a genetic standpoint of like chemicals and stuff. I was like, tea, tea, what? Oh, like drinking tea. Okay. Yes. yes. Like the, the most, tea, the most the tea like, bags. yeah. Okay. Well, Samantha, that's great. I think, um, I think what you're producing there for the larger cannabis community, which you don't have to, people don't have to get their genetics tested at Lobo to, to take advantage of this, of this cool, um, uh, platform that you have developed, which is a really generous offer to the cannabis community. Um, but they could also get their THC uh, tested. And right after this, I'll remind people how they can get a discount um, thanks to Lobo offering it here to the Adventures of the Mind um, sort of demographic, our, our listening community here. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, cool. That's it. We're done. Yay! Also, just so you know, the site went up on Friday, so you can go to Lobo Jane, as in Mary Jane. So you can go to LoboJane.com, and you can you can plug around and play with it and search with it. It's it's there. It's live. It's, it's oh, working. that's good. So. You know what? It's so, it's so funny because like as I was being like, thank you so much for your time. In between what I was saying to thank you so much, there was a moment where I was like, oh, you know what? I'm forgetting to ask her something. What is that thing I'm forgetting? Oh, shit. No, it's fine. We'll just close it out. The thing I was forgetting to ask you was, how do we get there? <laughs> Where do we go? Yeah. So I'll make sure I include that right afterwards. Okay, so again, that's it. You've stayed till the very end, so thanks. Um, you heard me say it again. Jesso, J-E-S-S-O, LoboGene.com, like genetics. Uh, and you'll get 30% off a THC or CBD testing kit. And if you do get your genetics tested through Lobo, head to the... Um, Head to the, excuse me, if you do get your genetics tested through Lobo, I would love to hear your thoughts and reviews on it, on your company and what you learned, if you're willing to share on the At Mind podcast subreddit. I'll leave a link uh, here to the specific thread that will be to this video so you can talk about it. Um, but I'd love to hear what your results are and what you learned in getting your genetic test results. So that's At Mind podcast subreddit and the link is in the description to this video. If you just want to support the channel, Adventures of the Mind, if you're appreciating this, then head to patreon.com forward slash James to be Gesso. Becoming a patron would be amazing. PayPal donations, also optional. Links to all of that are in the description. So thank you so much for tuning in all the way to the end here. And I'll see you on the next episode video for Adventures of the Mind. Take care. <laughs>